Evening, everyone. Um, thanks, Fred, for that uh, great intro. Um, it's an uh, honor and privilege to be a skinny chef amongst uh, the heavy chef talkers tonight, and uh, also some pretty big heavy chefs in the audience, so um, no pressure at all. Um, so yeah, as uh, Fred said, uh, my name is Brad, and I'm from a company called Platinum Seed, and we're here to um, present some findings out of a online retail research report we've done in conjunction with, well, actually that you know, Worldwide Works, where uh, Arthur's from a, a very reputable uh, market research company, has chosen to partner with us uh, alongside Visa um, to do this research on what is the state of the online, online retail in South Africa, effectively. Um, so I, I'm not going to be presenting the results. Uh, Arthur will. The last time I was on stage was on behalf of Arthur because he didn't rock up. So <coughs> thanks for arriving this time. Um, it, it, helps, it helps a lot. <laughs> British Airways, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been, a, it's been an amazing initiative. Um, we've, halfway through the process, we got endorsed by um, uh, the e-commerce forum of Africa, um, who I personally feel aren't getting enough sort of uh, leverage or awareness of what they're doing. So basically, they are really trying to create a, a lot of credibility um, in the uh, African e-commerce environment. It's totally, obviously, non-profit, um, very like influential people uh, running it. Um, but I really think they need to, need to get a lot more exposure for the great work that they're doing. So thank you to them as well. And then... Um, yeah, I just need to say thank you to, like, obviously, uh, and don't want to steal the stage, but to our amazing team at Platinum Seed, especially um, uh, Charlie uh, Matthews, who, who is heading up this research. Just an uh, unbelievable coordination, and, and it's really come together quite well. So just a little bit on the research. Um, we interviewed over 100 online retail uh, companies. Um, and the methodology was, was very, very direct. So it was, you know, deep, in-depth, half-an-hour phone calls, um, 26 questions, um, a lot of, lot of data. I think we collected over sort of 6,500 data points. So it is quite a robust uh, survey. And I think it, it gives some pretty good insights into what's going on in South Africa and the, the e-commerce uh, market here. So, yeah. Um, my, my presentation, though, I just want to see what we, where we uh, go with this clicker. Oh, there you go. Got it. Yeah, it wasn't on. Mm, sorry. Yeah, I'm pressing this one. That one, yeah. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, my presentation is going to be a bit more on sort of what are the global trends in, in e-commerce. So picture this for a second. <clears throat> You're 26 years old. Yeah, don't worry. I'm also, I'm also reminiscing about when I used to have hair. Um, and, and you live in China. And it's six o'clock in the morning and you're hard at work. And I know that's amazing for Cape Townians <laughs> that you're actually at work, but it's six o'clock as well. So, and uh, so if you picture this, maybe 40 years ago, the reality was that uh, this person might have been in a factory, working a field, or maybe hustling the streets of Beijing. But I'd like to introduce you to Yang, also known as Sunny, on a, a microblogging platform called Weibo. And work for Yang is that she's already been made up, all her makeup's done, and she is wearing a brand that she has designed and created, and she's getting her photo taken in front of landmarks in the Macau region of China. Um, over and above this, every day she works day in, day out, hourly, nurturing over three million fans that she has following her on Weibo, um, and also dealing with her suppliers, and running her online store. She sells her products on a... Oof, taxify for that person. Um, <laughs> so she sells, uh, she sells her, uh, her goods alongside other makeup and beauty products on an on a online store called uh, Taobao, which is an Alibaba-owned marketplace. And... Um, she recently took part in a festival called Singles Day, which is not where you actually like, it's not like a Tinder festival. It's just like a, it's kind of like a Black Friday. And in that one day, she managed to bring in half a million dollars of revenue for herself. So, um, 
So in China, uh, she's known as what is called the Wang Hong, which uh, Fred loved this, I think. It was like his favorite thing out of yesterday, which literally translates into a person who's popular on the internet. And it's a phenomenon that's in its third and most successful um, iteration in, in China at the moment. And what's really driving this phenomenon is um, the, the, in, the rapid, rapid growth and penetration of internet users um, in China. And to, to put this in perspective, Weibo, the app uh, or the microblogging platform I was talking about earlier, it has over 430 million active users. So if you just think about that for a second, that's well over the entire population of the US, which is probably about 350 million people. Um, so yeah, I mean, Wang, Wang Hong, but also to understand what is really underpinning why the Wang Hong phenomenon, which kind of sounds like a oh, cool J title, um, what, what really underpinning it is that China is making e-commerce so, so easy for the businesses that operate there and for the Wang Hong um, to really enable them to do what they do best, which is grow and sell products and, and grow the economy. So, mm, I'm going to give up on this one. I think I'm just going to wing it. Um, yeah, I'm just going to leave it. There's nothing too important on it. I might get to one of the stats later on. Um, we'll try to get there later on. So, I, I'm saying China for the win um, because um, I just think they're doing some amazing stuff. Uh, if you look at the global B2C e-commerce sales numbers, it's predicted to hit $2.8 trillion by the end of this year, okay? If you look at China's portion of that, it's 1.2, roughly, I'm talking rough figures here, so don't fact check me too hard, to $1.2 trillion. So if you look at that, I wanted to ask the question, why does China command 40% of all online global sales? And, um, and the first obvious answer is everyone's gonna go population. Right, they've got a massive population, yeah. They've got one and a half billion people, which is 21% of the world population. So I was like, okay, well, let's look at their internet usership. Maybe they've got 40% of the world's internet users. But nope, they've got 21% of the world's internet users. But yet, they still command 40% of the entire online global sales, uh, e-commerce sales, obviously. Um, and I think there's, there's, there's really two factors that are driving that. One, they have a very, very fast-growing middle class. And second, they have a very tech-savvy youth. Um, of, the, of their 800 million uh, internet users, 275 million are under the age of 25. So it, it's, it's really massive numbers. And I mean, if you look at that growth, it, it's really astounding. But what's really scary is that only 57% of their population have internet access at the moment. So where is that? Where is that? There's still huge opportunity here. So if we cross over the ocean, the Earth is round, so it doesn't. It's not that far over to the U.S. Um, there's a bit of a different sort of dialogue happening. Uh, dialogue happening in the U.S. where um, I personally feel that e-commerce is kind of either seen as friend or foe. Um, there's a lot of hype or a lot of news around, you know, it's killing traditional retail, all these traditional retailers are cl closing down. But on the other hand, if you ask any sort of reputable brand or, or retailer if e-commerce is part of their strategy, they all say yes. Um, in China, there isn't really this, this either-or dialogue happening. Um, they, they prefer to look at something that is, is, is what's called sort of new retail. And new retail is a, a term coined by Jack Ma, and I'm sure most of you know who Jack Ma is, but he's the founder of Alibaba, in case you don't, um, where, he talks, where he's really talking about uh, a uni-channel uh, approach. So not an omni-channel. Uh, omni-channel is something that you know, lots of people talk about, and I, I also couldn't really understand the difference between omni-channel and uni-channel, but I think what he's trying to get across here is that omni-channel is the coming together of a lot of different parts. Whereas unichannel is just so seamlessly integrated across the entire retail value chain that it, it's, it's uni, it's unichannel. So he's talking about the integration of online and offline worlds, logistics, everything that is just so seamlessly integrated, it feels, it feels like one. And um, that's really where, where China are, are, are winning at the moment, is that they, they follow this new retail approach. But there are another five reasons 
why they, why I believe uh, that China is doing so well. So I, I'm going to have to need my clicker here because I'm up on uh, this Prezo. Okay, so let me just uh, take a step back there because there was actually something else I wanted to chat about. Um, so all of this, all of this sort of new retail approach has led to, you know, China's online retail companies really significantly outgrowing their U.S. counterparts. And, and I'm just going to show you some, some stats here. So, I mean, there's a lot of numbers here, and I know some of the people at the back might not see them. But what I'm going to do is second taxify. Um, I'm going to focus on... I'm going to focus on Alibaba versus Amazon because those are the big ones and everyone sort of knows them. So if you look at Alibaba's uh, one-year revenue growth, it's 60%. And if you look at its five-year revenue growth, it's 49%. If you look at Amazon in comparison, uh, this one-year growth was 25%. And its five-year revenue growth was 18%. Now, these, both of these companies have got high bases. So don't start coming with that argument, right? Okay. They've both got very high bases. But... Um, if we go into profit margins, it gets a little bit more interesting because you can start seeing that Alibaba makes a lot more profit than Amazon. And obviously, Amazon is notoriously known for not making a profit due to reinvestment slash tax evasion. Um, <laughs> so, um, but what, what, what I really want to say here is that um, the Chinese, you know, if you look at the U.S. tech culture, the U.S. tech culture is a very, very unique market, one that has, for the most part, been impossible to replicate anywhere else around the world. Um, they've got access to huge amounts of cheap capital. Investors are quite forgiving. They tend to back the, the jockey, not the horse, and the vision. Uh, they like to chase market cap as opposed to nece not necessarily profit. Um, whereas in my, uh, my sort of observation is that China tends to to have a bit more of a sustainable view in that it, it chases market cap but also profits. And I mean, we see this happening now, you know, I don't, if, if you follow the sort of tech news, um, you know, there's been a big correction in the market and Tencent has lost a huge amount of value and Amazon has recently lost, I think, $250 billion of market cap in eight days or something ridiculous, or eight months, I think, but it took eight years to get to that market cap in the first place. So when all of these things start coming down, at least Alibaba's got profits <laughs> to, to, to please its investors. But also it's just a cultural thing um, between, you know, the U.S. tech culture and, and China. So, yeah. So why is China, China winning? So firstly, personalized discovery. And what I mean by that is, um, yes, uh, a lot of the really big, great online retailers use personalization. They use historic data uh, to understand your future purchase behavior, but um, I think the Chinese tend to take it one step further because they can monitor everything, um, in that they, they sort of overlay you know, a lot of social media behavior uh, alongside transactional data and CRM data to really guide people um, through, a, through a purchasing process. As I mentioned before, seamless sales. Um, so what I'm talking about there is their integration is ubiquitous. It's just so, so well done. It doesn't matter where you're on, what platform you're on. If you're playing a game, if you're reading the news, uh, if you're on WeChat, you can literally buy stuff with one click. Um, it's just that easy. They just make it so, so easy. Um, in terms of content being king, live streaming is, is becoming really, really popular um, in China at the moment. Um, and also they're, they're starting to play a lot with um, augmented reality and virtual reality. They've got an app where you can, um, it's like a mirror app, where you can see what lipstick looks like on you before you buy it. Uh, I haven't tried it yet. Um, and uh, B2C innovation. So what I mean there is it's in terms of their social listening, they really listen, they use a lot of social listening tools to get insights into what their customers want, and they, they very rapidly um, cater to, to those customers. Um, and then in terms of agility, flexibility, and speed, I mean, uh, I mean, if you look at Chinese sort of, China's sort of historic industry, it just has the ability to manufacture anything very, very quickly. In fact, a lot of e-commerce companies that are opening up in China, the smaller sort of brands, they can actually sell their goods before the guys have even started manufacturing them because they know that they can, they can manufacture them by the time it's been sold online. It's, it's that fast. 
in terms of their distribution, um, you know, they use uh, electric tricycles to, to deliver goods. There's over 20,000 career companies in China that employ over 2 million people. So their ability to, in terms of fulfillment, which we'll probably get into a little bit later because it tends to be quite a headache for in, in the African context, um, is just really, really amazing. So, yeah, in China, it's not really an either-or um, argument. It's really a human-centric approach that puts the customer first, uh, then the company, and then China uh, for everyone to win. So who knew that, you know, putting the customer first was such a good strategy? Um, and it's the next, you know, a lot of people ask, uh, where to from here? So B2C sales... E on online, resale, online retail sales are $2.8 trillion, as, uh, as I said. Uh, but if you look at B2B sales globally, those are, that's $8 trillion. So if you start logic and sort of research will tell you that if you own the consumer market, you will very quickly transcend over to the B2B market. So I think, personally, I think that's the trend for China going next. They're going to start growing into more of a B2B or a bigger B2B player. So, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about China. Um, but I think maybe we should bring it a little bit closer to home for the moment. Um, so, how many people in the audience have heard of a company called Jimia? Okay, a couple, not bad. So, um, Jimia, not Jumo, Jim, Jimia is a Nigerian e-commerce company that currently operates in uh, 14 countries in Africa. And it is Africa's first unicorn. And a unicorn is a tech company that it, or a privately held company that has got a valuation of over a billion dollars. Um, and Jumia is uh, often referred to as the Amazon of Africa. Um, but I prefer to think of them, once again, because I love what the Chinese are doing, as the China um, of Africa. And I'll tell you why. is because just like Alibaba, and just like a, a play out of Jack Ma's sort of new retail playbook, um, they like to turn operational challenges into a strategic advantage. So what I mean by that is Africa's got a lot of problems with fulfillment. They can't, you know, they can't deliver goods to rural villages. Uh, there's data issues. There's people not being banked and able to pay. You know, we, we've heard these issues over and over, both locally and abroad, although I, I tend to think of South Africa as not really a traditional African country. We are, I think, a little bit more developed in, in that sense. Um, so what they do is, I mean, their CEO... Jimmy CEO turns around and says, you know, they're really trying to, to open up the marketplace, drive prices down in, and do and really open up the market in new ways. And if you look at, like, what are these new ways, I'll just give you three quick examples. So one is that they, they were one of the first companies that allowed people to pay with cash on delivery. So you can order something, comes to your door, you pay with cash, uh, which is massive for most of Africa because most of Africa doesn't have a formal banking sector. Um, the second thing they have did was um, they partnered with real like entrepreneurs. It kind of reminds me of the Uber, Uber model where they've partnered with uh, drivers to be able to go do fulfillment, even in the most rural of places, places without names. And the third thing that they've done is um, they've launched the sales team called, I think, the J team um, that um, will actually go and purchase on your behalf if you don't have internet access um, or if you don't trust the platform yet. So they'll use their own money, purchase it, and then you can sort of pay them back. So they really are doing some very innovative things to help grow, uh, grow the economy. And that's why I think that they are, um, that they are gonna be the sort of next Alibaba of, of Africa. I think you know, Amazon dominate the US. Alibaba mostly dominates uh, the Asian market, and I think Jimmy are set to, to dominate um, Africa. So if we look at, uh, at Africa as a whole, 50% of all Africans will have smartphones by the year 2020. That's what's predicted, which is pretty massive considering we've got one of the fastest growing populations as a continent in the world. And uh, we'll have $2.1 trillion of buying power by 2025. 
Um, which, so that just shows you the massive growth that is in, and the massive opportunity that lies uh, within Africa. So five e-commerce trends. And these, uh, as a disclaimer, are not mine. They're from a website called Trend Watcher, but I just thought they were really good. Um, plus, being a lazy presenter, I decided to steal them. Um, but no, th I think they really ring true. So the first one is welcome to the bazaar. And what, what that means is... Um, in most African countries, uh, don't picture South Africa here too much here, people set up shop at markets and everyone goes to markets to shop. And that's where you haggle, that's where you compare prices, that's where you get the best sort of customer service, it's loud, it's bustling. And what it really talks about is like a unified platform where all of these, these entrepreneurs can come and sell their goods. Um, the second trend is, as we've already spoken about, master delivery. So the brands and retailers that are going to thrive in the African environment are those that come up with very, very innovative ways of fulfillment. The third is proudly African. And what that talks about is what people actually sell online. So that it, we're talking about local goods um, that generally you, that you couldn't get out into a global market before. So not only do... Africans not uh, they don't only want to buy you know Yeezys and U.S. made or Chinese made goods, but um, they want to they want to buy their own products right, and it gives entrepreneurs a chance to do that not only in their own markets but globally as well. And I think there's some great South African examples of of that. Um, I know Fred's uh, Fred's girlfriend is uh, is driving an e com or behind an e commerce site that does exactly that curated African goods if I'm not mistaken. Um, the next one is caring is crucial. So this kind of talks to that consumers have tend to be sort of badly treated by merchants in the past because of scarcity and because they didn't really have a choice. But as they're becoming modernized in Africa, they're not, they're not going to put up with that, right? So it's, it's really about that customer centricity. And the last one is the right touch points. And that's really about, you know, you've got this flurry of, of um, touch points that can snow blind you. And it's really about using data and data analytics to really better understand uh, customers, their journeys, and intercept them with, well, not intercept them, but, you know, serve them the right messaging at the right time at the right place. So those are the trends um, uh, that uh, we see for Africa. So I think um, just one final takeout that I want to take out of Jack Ma's new retail playbook is, is, his, is his purpose. Someone asked him, you know, what is your purpose? And he said this. He said, we want to do something good while making money. We trust people more than our products. And for me, it's, it's that trust that uh, online retailers really need to build with customers um, that will make uh, e-commerce thrive um, in, in Africa and South Africa. Thanks very much, guys.